When author and visual artist Tava Harrison died of cancer at the age of 42, it left a hole in the hearts of friends and loved ones. Her final book, Not One of These Poems Is About You, chronicles living with metastatic breast cancer as she prepared to leave those loved ones behind. Her husband, David Leonard, lived that story at her side, and now he is not only tending to the legacy that she left, but also contending with what that loss means for him. He is the senior director of Six Degrees at the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, and David Leonard joins us now. It's so good to see you again. Thanks for having me. There's an old expression in Yiddish, which is auf simchas, which means I wish it were on happier occasions, but you know what I mean. Yes, thank you so much for that. If you didn't know Teva, how would you describe her? Uh, Teva was, she was a light, she was a force. You know, this, this woman uh, attracted everyone who met her into her orbit, you know, and, and I think a lot of people, after they're gone, people say the same sort of cliched things about them. They were a light, they attracted people around them, but she had this extra gear of uh, empathy, I think, that people were really attracted to. So I found myself, when I first met her, just drawn into her orbit, and I think everyone that met her felt the same thing. She lived with hope and with energy and with optimism. She laughed a lot. Uh, she was beautiful, uh, youthful, and really em embraced a kind of uh, lust for life that a lot of people don't have. Now, she was from the States, so how did you two meet? So she's American, uh, and she was a film programmer, uh, and she was visiting Toronto uh, and TIFF, searching for films in 2001 and 9-11 happened. And so she ended up being stranded in Toronto because of 9-11, uh, and she was supposed to go to New York on the 13th of September, but of course, travel was all blocked out, so she was staying with a friend, and uh, we met that weekend, and uh, immediately felt a connection, and we got married seven months later. Isn't that crazy? That is maybe one, well, one of the very few good things that happened as a result of 9-11. It's a remarkable story, I mean, such a tragedy, you know, and, and then, but for us, I think it was a time when so much was, um, so much was available, you know, th things felt unstable, th things felt unsteady, there was no communications, everything was really uh, fraught, and so we found ourselves thrust together in this time uh, in this really meaningful way, and I think we both sort of thought, well, here's this person who lights me up, uh, let's go for it. How many years were you two together before she discovered she had cancer? So she was diagnosed in December of 2013, so at that point it would be about 12, a little over 12 years. Um, and it had been 12 good years and 12 healthy years and no sign of any issue coming at all. And it wasn't in the family? And it, it wasn't the family. I mean, she had a family history of certain types of cancer, but according to the um, medical uh, establishment, you know, she didn't meet the threshold for risk, but she was obviously very concerned about it, so she was getting tests all the time. How did she discover it? Uh, she found a lump. Well, actually, she had back pain first, uh, and she had a lot of back pain, and she went to eMERGE a few times and asked them about their, her back pain and they would send her away with not cancer. You know, maybe you lifted something funny, maybe you, um, you sat a funny way, maybe there's a, an issue with how you're sleeping. Uh, and then it just got worse and worse and worse, and then she found a lump in her breast, uh, and then went back in and immediately got fast-tracked through the system, and they found that not only was it breast cancer, but it was, uh, she was diagnosed at stage four metastatic breast cancer. So it was in her breast, in her lymph nodes, and also in her spine, which is why she had the back pain. There's a tendency when you talk about somebody who uh, has succumbed to that to speak a lot about the death, and I really don't want to do that. I really want to speak a lot about her life because uh, she packed so much into her 42 years. She sure did. Uh, she was here on this set talking about her memoir, In Between Days, uh, which was essentially her cancer journey. What yeah. was she trying to say in that book? You know, when she was first diagnosed, she, she went looking for um, what it would be like. What would it be like to have cancer, you know, especially metastatic cancer is a very specific trajectory. It's terminal. You understand that, you know, there's no run for the cure. There's no survive. I mean, there is some for some people, but for her, she, she was, it was a terminal illness. And so she went looking for what's it like as a 37 year old woman to have metastatic cancer. And she found a lot of things out there for children and for older people. And she found very few things that spoke directly to her experience. Uh, and then she, she, started writing for herself and drawing for herself, and that turned into um, what became In Between Days, uh, which essentially was a project to create the kind of thing that she wanted to find when she was looking. I have it here in my hands. Yeah. And Sheldon, you want to bring that up? We've got a shot. We've got a, a still from the book, because it isn't just uh, the story. Uh, it's pictures, too. She um, 
How did the how did drawing the cartoons help her deal with her illness? You know, she started. I mean, drawing was her was one of her was one of her coping mechanisms, and so we. She spent a lot of time drawing in a meditative way, redrawing tiny little flowers again and again and again. Uh, and then that was before diagnosis and just, just it was something that she enjoyed to do doing. And then when she was diagnosed, uh, you know, as part of uh, her conversations with a therapist and with some other people with cancer, she started morphing her drawing into drawing about her life. And it, and it became the comics. And then the comics ended up at the Walrus website. Uh, and then that turned into uh, her blog and writing, and then that turned into this book. And so she found, um, in a way, voicing the, the fear uh, and voicing the experience helped her process it. But in a bigger way, it helped her find a community. Because a lot of people who found the book once it became a book uh, said to her, me too, I've never seen myself represented this way. And oh, I thought it was only me. And, and the book is very honest and very true. And I think because of that, you know, she found this warm community of support around the drawing. So at the very base level for her, it was how do you um, make sense of this thing that's happening to you. But then the broader effect of it was how do you build a community around this of people who are sharing this experience? It was really blunt. There were parts in the book yeah. that were really blunt. David, yeah. I talked to her about your sex life she on did. this show. Because yes, she wrote yeah. about it in the book. Yeah. And you didn't veto any of that, eh? You know, we sat together and she said, look, I think this, this, there's a lot of stuff I've been drawing and writing that feels uh, very personal and I want to make sure you're okay with it. And so I said to her, you know, um, my, my only guideline for you is that this thing has to be true. And for it to actually have an, an impact in the world and for it to actually do what she wanted to do, which was help other people, um, it needed to be true. Because what she was looking for was someone to say, this is how it really is. Not to say, here's how it might be, or here's how, if you do this, it will be okay. She wanted someone to say, here's some of the bad stuff, here's some of the good stuff, here's some of the fears, here's some of the truths, uh, and that only works if it's true. And her whole thing was beauty in the world. And, I mean, truth is beauty. So I was willing to put myself on the line a bit to, to let that be true. And if that means that she's on the agenda talking about our sex life, well, so be it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, kudos to you both, because yeah. it, was, it, was, it was bluntly honest, and, and you, too, deserve a heck of a lot of credit well, for being you. prepared yeah. to put yourself out there. Thank you. You know, uh, when you appear on a television program, you kind of achieve a, a bit of immortality because you are always there yeah. and people can always find you. Yeah. And we found some of Teva. All right. Sheldon, if you would. Here's a really weird question. What goes through your head when you hear people complain about the weather? <laughs> I complain about the weather. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I actually appreciate people who complain about normal things. So often if I'm having a conversation with somebody I'm close to, or someone I care about, they'll start to complain about something. Then they'll say, oh, oh, oh. But with everything you're going through, you don't want to hear about that. But I do, because that's, that's having a real relationship with people. Their complaints aren't less valid just because I have this one really really, really awful thing in my life. Can I tell you what is almost as beautiful as that answer? Is watching you out of the corner of my eye just now, smiling at the memory of that. Yeah. That is beautiful. And that's the way she lived her life. I mean, she was, she was, in that answer, what she said to you was, you know, I, like, my thing is big, but I still care about your thing. And that was, that's what the book was about, and that's what her life was about. How do you maintain your sense of humor, though, in the midst of but, you know, a fatal illness. I think you have to, and I think for her, it was, it was, the, it's the only way. I mean, life, mm -hmm. life for her was so precious and so beautiful, and she was, she was really all about trying to live, recognizing the magic in the small moments and the magic of relationships. And I think um, she lived with such hope and optimism that the only way to do that was to maintain a uh, connection with people. And the mm -hmm. connection with people is often through humor, and it's often through exactly what you just saw in that clip. This is the latest. This is the latest. Not one of these poems is about you. Yeah. That's kind of a funny title for a book of poetry. It is. What's it yeah. supposed to get at? Uh, I mean, I think she, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I this, you know, one of the, the, the problems, you know, when someone, when someone has gone early is that you don't always have all the answers. So mm -hmm. I actually, we talked about the title a little bit. I think she thought it was a, a play on the fact that this was a very personal book. Um, but at the same time, with all of her writing, it's universal. So, you know, she's dealing with, in this book, universal truths, you know, life, death, legacy, love, these big issues. So even though everyone recognizes themselves in these things, in her mind, this book was really a very personal, a personal project. Was there something in this book that she said that she either felt she couldn't or hadn't said in the previous book? 
Yeah, I think I think this book, uh, you know, in between days was really how do how do you make sense of living well with a terminal illness, and I think she demonstrated that through you know being joyful, and she demonstrated that through empathy, and then in between these two books, she did something called the Joyful Living Coloring Book, which for her was just how do you live with joy and beauty, and so she made this book of whimsical drawings that people could color, which was very meditative for some people, but also for her fun to draw dinosaurs eating cake and these goofy sort of things. Uh, this new book. Uh, in a lot of ways, is her reckoning with saying goodbye. You know, so she's she's writing in this book, um, and it can be quite difficult for the reader, I think. But but she's dealing with the big questions of life and death. And I think the the first book was searching, and I think this book is finding. And so she really evolved in a way to be um, giving uh, her true full self into this. So there's fear in this book, and there's regret in this book, but there's also an incredible amount of love for the world that she lived. Uh, and the world that she saw, and the people that she's leaving behind, and so there's. So I think the new part is is a kind of reckoning, in a way that the first book didn't have. You know, whenever we have authors on this program, we usually read an excerpt of their work. Yeah. You gonna mind if I read a little? That's okay. Go ahead. Uh, a pocket full of stones is one of the poems I'd like to read an excerpt from. It's a lovely metaphor. A pocket full of stones, and here we go. This time, when she dies, a blissful moment when I feel nothing. Then it rolls up from the pit of my stomach a wave of kneeing wails. I'm left behind, moving among the living, alive. It's raining, but we're still climbing the table mountain. I stop at the trailhead, retie my shoes. Wait, I kneel down, palms flat against the ground. You watch as I fill my pockets with stones. One for you, one for me, one each for my mother and three sisters. More still for my friends who didn't survive. Why does that poem speak to you? I mean, this is obviously a true story. You know, we climbed Table Mountain together. Where's uh, that? It's in Cape Town, South, South Africa. You know, one of her dreams was to see drafts in the wild. So shortly after she was diagnosed, we found our way to Africa and did some did a safari. And on that trip, we went to Cape Town. And so she um, was really uh, lived in nature, and she lived in marking moments. And so for Teva, a, a huge part of what the way she wanted to live is to recognize the people who are struggling. Uh, to recognize the things that she can do to put them in her mind, to mark the occasion somehow in nature. So we climbed Table Mountain and she had pockets full of stones and she, she laid them down on the top of that mountain and she spoke the names of the people of, of her friends who had died and she spoke the names of the people of her friends who are still here. And to her this was, she believed in magic and magic of not casting spells and, and waving a magic wand, but the magic that's evident in every single day. So the beauty of a sunrise or the the moment when you take a breath of fresh air. Uh, you know, she believed that those moments were special and those moments were worth celebrating. So for her, standing on the top of this mountain after the exertion of climbing this ridiculous path, you know, it was misty and rainy and, and to put stones on the ground and say the names of people she loved uh, was a moment in nature for her. And so I think for me, it's, it shows that she was always part of a community, but also that she's always part of the world. When she got her diagnosis, did she have any sense about how long she would last? Um, they, it's always a tough question. They, they don't really tell you because they don't really know. So the median survival rate for her cancer was two to two and a half years. And she got double that. And she got five and a half years. So I think she was already on the um, long tail of what was expected. I think she really beat, beat a lot of the odds and expectations for that diagnosis. Uh, and a lot of that I think is because she lived the way she lived, you know, with joy and with optimism and with hope. You wrote uh, a really great piece in the Globe and Mail a couple of months ago, and I want to just read a little excerpt from that. Because she discovered a way to live with hope and beauty despite the challenges of cancer, Teva is supporting me as I navigate my grief. She tapped into some universal truths about what makes a life and what is important, and it is invaluable to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Help us out with that. What truths of life did she tap into that have been helpful to you? You know, it's it's such a unique position to be in a in a dialogue, you know, with someone who's gone. Uh, and I think a lot of people in my situation, you know, when someone is gone, you wish if only I had one more conversation, or, or you know, when you play the video earlier, if only I could see them or hear their voice, you know. And so Teva, because she did so much work in the public sphere, whether it was lectures or interviews or or writing, you know, I have her voice there, and so. Uh, in having cancer, she had to navigate a lot of really challenging uh, social situations, challenging situations at work, all these issues where the invisibility, especially for the first few years of her cancer, I mean, she looks healthy and she looked strong and you'd never know if you saw her. And that creates um, a sort of dissonance sometimes when 
she's having a horrible day, feeling terrible from cancer, and no one can tell, it, it sort of creates a strange um, dissonance. And so I find myself, grief, there are parallels. And you know, see, so these parallels of grief are, uh, I'm also sometimes having a horrible day, and you never know. And no one expects that I'm going to be having, uh, you know, that I'll be dealing with something in a, in a different way. And so these truths are things like letting herself off the hook when she just wasn't up to it, or understanding that fatigue is, is OK, or understanding that the people who are around you to support you um, sometimes are the people you think they are, and sometimes they're not. You know? And so you have to find yourself gravitating towards where the support is, but also looking inside yourself. Uh, and these, these, these things are absolutely parallel between our experiences. But the biggest one is, is kindness. You know, she lived her life with kindness. And I think that it's easier to be kind than it is to be cruel. And she lived her life that way. And it opened up for her, you know. And, and by saying yes to life and by saying yes to people, she found herself with a lot of opportunity. And I find myself in the same situation where um, it's easy to feel closed and it's easy to feel um, negative. But, you know, she's sort of guiding me to choose kindness and to be positive and to sort of embrace the help that's around me and embrace what the world has to offer. How relevant a message is that for today in particular? It, oh my goodness. It feels very timely. I mean, yeah. I think the thing about the way she lived her life is it, and this is why I think these books go beyond a cancer experience or an illness experience. I mean, these books are about, you know, how do you in a difficult time in a difficult world find a way to live hopefully and joyfully despite everything that's going on, all the divisions, all of the problems in society, all of the nasty rhetoric. Mm. How do you choose to be kind? And she found a way. At what point do you stop thinking of her every day? It's hard to say. It hasn't happened yet. Really? Yeah. You still think of her every day? Every day. Every yeah. day. Yeah. I mean, grief is a strange, I mean, it, there's no playbook, right? And so I think for some people in my situation that they'll, there's a timeline and a playbook and you understand that by doing X, Y, and, and Z, you'll be able to achieve these milestones of grief. Uh, it doesn't manifest that way, at least it hasn't for me. Uh, it's this slippery, I, it's this slippery floor, you know, where some days it, everything's fine and then one thing will happen and you're, and you're back in it again, you know? I, I don't feel like it's been an um, incremental improvement. I feel like it's, it, it comes, uh, it sort of washes over you or doesn't, you know? So every day I think of her and some days it's, it's awful and some days it's wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's a process, you know? And I think I, I, all I have to do is walk the road of grief and see where it takes me. There is a line in the, I guess this is the inscription here, yeah. and I'm not sure I can actually pronounce it, so you might need to help me. L'espoir fait vivre. Yeah. yeah. Hope makes life. Hope makes life. What, what language is that? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a Haitian proverb. It is? Yeah, okay. So it's Creole, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And do you know why it's there? I mean, it's there because she, I think, I mean, I, you know, she had no particular connection to Haiti. I think she probably, you know, she did a lot of reading about hope and a lot of reading about about um, what makes a life, and I think she probably found that along the way, and it spoke to her. And I think for her, the act, the act of creating anything in a dark time is an act of hope. So the act of writing a poetry book and doing drawings like Not One of These Poems Is About You is an act of hope and an act of optimism. And so for her, the only way to reconcile the fact that she had a terminal illness uh, was to, to live in hope and optimism, that maybe science would catch up or maybe she'd have a miracle, or maybe there'd be some sort of something that would come and take her out of this situation. Uh, it's easy to give up, I think. It's easy to say, well, this is my lot, so be it. That wasn't in her character. You know, she lived, uh, she lived with hope, and that to her was the absolute core of it, that without hope, what's the point? Can I ask you a bit of an awkward question to finish this off? Sure. Uh, you know, you're a pretty young guy still, right? Yeah. How old are you now? 44. 44, okay. Yeah. Do you ever worry that, you know, even at this very young stage of life, you've experienced the great love of your life <laughs> and you may not ever again? Uh, yeah, I do worry about that. No, it's, um, yeah, I mean, of course it's a concern. I mean, I think, I think I'm not at a stage where I'm thinking about um, what comes in the future. I think, I think what I've learned, and this is what I've learned from Teva, is that with, with her cancer diagnosis, we lived in very short increments of decision making because from scan to scan, everything can change. And so what we found ourselves doing is living in this very, um, I guess now we call it a mindful state of, of taking the world as it comes uh, and not putting too much pressure on the past or the future. Uh, and so I find myself now doing the same thing. So I'm 44 years old. Uh, I had a be very beautiful 18-year relationship with a woman who I love, um, and the future holds who knows what, uh, and I'll take it as it comes. 
Well, I gotta tell you, the memorial service you held for her at the Art Gallery of Ontario was maybe the most meaningful memorial service I've ever Thank been you. to in my life. I mean, it was just astonishingly wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And it was packed with people who knew her and loved her and loved you. Yeah, I it mean. It was great. I mean, we tried to do, uh, the idea was not too sad because Tava's, and this is Tava's legacy, Tava's legacy, and there's a poem about this in the book where she talks about me and moving on in my life. I mean, her legacy was that people who were touched by her her, her presence or her writing or her speaking or her drawing or whatever it was, would find a way to live in joy and in hope and to find connection with each other and to find peace in the world. And so, you know, that memorial service was full of light and flowers and there was nothing black and it was very uplifting. And in that room was a whole bunch of people who had experienced her, um, you know, close friends, family, people from television. I mean, all sorts of people that she encountered along the way. And that, and that to her, the legacy of Teva in a way, for me, is the, is the bit of herself that she left and all the people that, that she encountered. And I think that's all of our legacy. So I think she can feel very good about the fact that, or I can feel very good about the fact that, um, you know, the joy that she sparked in people uh, radiated out and at that event and I think still today. Amen. We are happy to remind people of the title of this book, Not One of These Poems Is About You, by Tava Harrison. And David, it's so good of you to come in and help all of us remember her tonight here on TVO. Well, thanks for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.